I think particularly, uh, Leslie, you were talking about how when you enter a room, you connect with people based on the, the, the race aspect of your identity. How does that reflect for, for everyone else? Uh, do you want me to go first? Um, Whoever so, wants to go, <laughs> yes. Well, um, so I think it's fascinating. I think race and identity absolutely go hand in hand, although they're not always synonymous. Um, and one way I think I could, uh, I think about or exemplify it is, you know, I'm a, I'm a proud Asian, a proud Asian American, and also a proud Coloradan. Um, mm. That's part of my identity. But I think if someone were to take a screenshot of this panel, and there was the question above it that asked, is this the panel of Coloradans? My guess would be a lot of people would assume no. And then maybe a second group of people would assume, or maybe respond, maybe, but I'd wanna hear more about each person's background. And what I think is interesting about that is I think if we were a panel of white men with goatees and the question at the top was, is this a panel of Coloradans? I don't think there would be as many people saying like, well, I want to hear more about their background. and Where are they from and where are their parents from? And I think it's because of race, right? I think the image when someone says, what does a Coloradan look like? Um, a lot of people think of Colorado as a very white state and they don't think of black, Latino, Asian, um, community. So I, I just think that that's something good for us to challenge because, you know, I, you know, my parents, uh, I've been in Colorado for a long time. I was raised here. My kids are Coloradans. And that's something that I self identify with. But, you know, I think if as a state or as a community, we could erode some of the skepticism that comes with, you know, when a person of color says they're Coloradan. That would feel like, uh -huh, yeah. that would feel like progress. Hmm. Did anyone else have anything to say on, on that topic? You know, I hadn't thought of it that way, um, Annie, but it's a, so true, right? Like, um, it's like, and first of all, most panels still are white, all white men, right? And they're like, I'm a Colorado and I got my cowboy boots on in politics too, right? I got my cowboy boots on and my, my business jacket and I'm a Colorado. And, and then I'm like, I'm a Colorado. And it's like, but where are you from? You know, or especially <laughs> when I'm out of state, it's like, there's not black people in Colorado. Like, what are you talking about? You know, it's so interesting. And like, but, but here's the question that we all probably get, but where are you actually from? You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> No, really, um, where are you from? Yeah, no, really, where are you from? So it is interesting, yeah. Are all three of you natives of Colorado? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I admit to being a little bit snobby about it because I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Denver native, you know, and, and to me that's, you know, somebody moved here six months after they were born, mm, that doesn't quite <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, and, and and it gets even more parochial than that. I, I'm a I'm a Park Hill I'm a Park Hill native, you uh, know, and I'm you know that's that's my spot on the planet. And uh, you know, I have great reverence for Park Hill moms who I think rule the world. But uh, you know, so I take it down to my little microcosm, and and um, uh, it, it it's really interesting though the question of where are you from. You know, I I know what people are asking. They want to know my ancestry and right. it, it, it's tiring. I, I will tell you that, it, that it, gets, it gets really tiring when, when you know that's the question that's coming and whether it's the first day of class in college and the professor's going around and, and struggles with your last name a little bit and asks, you know, wh where, are you, where are you from? You know, I, a lot of times I'm like, Denver? And, and I, I, I know what they're asking. I, I know what the question is. And I, uh, but, but, I, but I do like to kind of stop people and get them to reflect on what really is their question. What, what, what are you really trying to get at? I, know, I already know, but, but what, you know, is, is, that, is that okay for you to be kind of pressing, pressing me on this kind of, kind of thing? Right. First uh, James, 
what James just said hugely resonates with me, right? Is I, uh, I do like to, you know, maybe it's a little passive aggressive, but I do force people to ask the question <laughs> they really want to ask, which is a lot of times when they, you know, if, if they, they say, no, no, what's your nationality? And I always respond like, American. I'm American right. citizen. They're like, no, no, where are you from? And I say, Denver. And they're like, no, no, where are you really from? And what they're yeah. trying to say is what your ethnic background or what race are you? Or where are your parents, you know, where are your parents or grandparents from? Is what they're trying to ask. And I think it's just a fascinating topic because, because of the, by virtue of the color of our skin, like bringing it to some of the tensions we have in our communities today, you know, I have been told, even recently, told is a nice way to say it, but you know, my, my family has been targeted with comments like, go back to where you came from, which is highly offensive and problematic. And it stems from exactly this issue is people make assumptions about your identity and your home based on the color of your skin and assumptions they make of like, well, Colorado is white or America is white. And that's where I think challenging that, that becomes healthy. Yeah, and, and so to answer your question, um, I am not from Colorado. And it's interesting because people uh, ask, or I wasn't born in Colorado, people ask me where I'm from. And I usually say Denver, you know, or Park Hill. Yeah. Um, and uh, I will, and then they're like, but, but no, but where are you, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Well, I was born in Germany, you know? And when I say that, I'm like, wait a minute, that, that doesn't make sense. Now, if I said I was born in Chicago, but lived all my life in Denver, they say, oh, well, then you're from Chicago. But when I say Germany, they're like, I don't know, that doesn't connect either. Like, you're not white and blonde enough right. for that. Excuse my puppy. <laughs> well, you know, I think um, there is. So I think that is, I think that is interesting. And it's a question that I've had forever. Yeah. I, I think there's something interesting in um, a person examining what their compulsion is to know somebody's ethnic background. Like, why do you need to know that? What is it that you're really trying to figure out? Are you trying to categorize somebody? Uh, we have a question about if there's a better way to ask about heritage and background. I think it's worth considering um, what is the context and why do you want to know that? And then, then may, there might be better ways to ask the question once you arrive at that answer for yourself. But, you know, like, um, I don't really need to know Annie's background to continue a conversation or interaction. Uh, you know, I don't ask people when I meet them uh, what childhood traumas that they've had. You know, like, <laughs> I accept what it is that they present to me. Uh, and as we get to know each other more, then some of those details come out more. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if any of the panelists have ideas about a better way to ask that question, but I, I would say Perhaps it's not even important to ask that question. Yeah, I mean, in my experience, it, it definitely, it depends. De depends on, I mean, to be honest, it depends on who's asking sometimes in the context. Yeah. You know, if it's someone, you know, friendly, who's like visiting my book club and they're kind of struggling with the question. Like sometimes I just do them a favor because what, what James said, again, you know, it kind of gets tiring to do the dance sometimes. And sometimes I just feel like I'm toying with them after a while. So I'm like, okay, what you really want to know, what you really want to know is, you know, you want to know is my background Japanese, Chinese. And sometimes, you know, people ask with very good intentions, you know, um, I've had experiences where people have asked me because they once studied Mandarin Chinese in college and they want to practice, but not if I know Japanese or Korean, right? And so, I think uh, it depends on the circumstance and I'm usually not too mean about it. I, if I can tell that's what they're going for, but if it's, you know, I, I totally agree with you though, um, Alan, and that, you know, I, I don't always love it when that's the opening question. <laughs> right, right. It's a little, it can be a little stark. Yeah, that's what, yeah. what I was saying. Just like, don't make it like the first question. You know what I mean? Like, there's right. no need for that. And then it makes you wonder why. Like. Is that going to change your impression of me um, or Annie or James based on what our answer is? Um, there's other icebreakers, right? There's other ways to get to know somebody. And I think that if you just spend a little bit of time going beyond the surface, um, you get to know someone in a much better and deeper level anyway. So 
Um, you know, I mean, if you're wearing a Bronco shirt or a Park Hill shirt, you can ask them, hey, are you from Park Hill? Or did you grow up here or something like that? But, you know, if we just are showing up in the world, um, asking about uh, things that are actually quite deeply personal too um, and can come across as somewhat offensive, you know, just maybe wait a little bit and just uh, <laughs> ask and get to know that person a little better first. Right. We have some questions in the chat about uh, do, do white people tend, is it usually white people who ask this question? I think that's a really, uh, uh, for me, yes. You know, uh, I've, I've had white people come up to me and uh, just to begin a conversation, I took African-American studies in college, you know, and that's, <laughs> and uh, I don't know that that is the basis of, uh, of, a, of a conversation, you know. Um, and then people are making points about do, do people ask white people where they're from and are they looking for them to include race in their response? So, right. you know, yeah, I think uh, it, it, it is a pretty interesting sort of cultural thing. And I think what it, what it tells me, depending on the context, as Annie mentioned, it tells me that that, that that is the main thing on that person's mind, that they are not actually trying to interact with my humanity. Right, mm. like they're not interested in what books I've read or uh, what I'm passionate about. That, like that is like I need to know this. I need to know what is your ethnic background immediately. <laughs> you know, and maybe a one twist on it because I think you know, and um, you know, Carol, who I've known uh, I know well, you know, like probably one of the first questions I asked Carol when I met her was, "Where did you grow up?" because that has nothing to do with your ethnicity or race or you know your your ethnic heritage but i was really curious to know like hey carol where did you grow up because i think if you also grew up in colorado or you grew up in germany or california you know cuz i think you know i always get a lot of times people assume that i'm from california they'll actually come to me uh -huh. oh are you from california like no <laughs> no i'm not but um, I think that question, where did you grow up, that is something I, I think is a natural um, question to, to get to know someone better. It's, it's, uh, it's a little bit more race neutral as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. race, race neutral. Oh, oh go ahead. Liza. No, 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 go ahead. I think the other interesting thing um, and that triggered when Alan said something was the, the like codes, you know, too. Like, oh, like they don't want to say, you know, I guess people maybe are trying to connect, but it, it's, it doesn't quite work. And it's like, oh, um, hi, you know, I'm Leslie, whatever. I love five points. Or I went to MDs <laughs> growing up. Or do you go to Welton Street Cafe? Like, do you like chicken? Like, it's just these like <laughs> codes that come out. And I just find that, I'm ready to, to, to find humor in them and different ways that folks try to say that they like black people. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. it's quite fascinating. You know, for, for, for me, it's margaritas, Leslie. Oh, I, I make great margaritas. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it is uh, funny. You, you know, I, it, Alan, you, you made a good point as to uh, why, why is that important information? Why, why is that the first thing that, that's coming up? And, and why, why is that box one you want to put me in right away? I mean, there, there's a lot of other stuff. And, and, and Annie, I think the question of where you grew up. Now that's neutral. And that can, that can almost tell you as much in a, in a much more neutral way, in, in, in a much more um, and, um, open and less offensive way. And if, and if I say I grew up in, in Mexico, I didn't, I'm a, you know, again, I'm a Park Hill guy, but if I say I grew up in Mexico, then I think the line of questioning about Mexico and language and, you know, all, all that is, it's highly appropriate. I mean, we're kind of we're kind of there already. But uh, um, I think the whole "Where are you from?" question is it, it's almost offensive right off the bat for me, um, and 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 it's almost like uh, it's it, it's almost a stated other than mm -hmm. like not like let's assume I'm from here. You're not going to ask me where I'm from. Let's assume I'm from here. Where are you from? You're different, so it's fair game for me to ask you where you're from. And that's, you know, yeah. off the bat, I, 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 find it, I find it a little off-putting, and, and, and I, I think there's a lot of other ways to kind of get to know people and relate to people other than uh, go, going right for the question of ethnicity or, or 
it's really not the question of ethnicity. It's the skirting around the question of ethnicity. Yeah. Right. I would be careful about the where did you grow up, though, because I think um, that can also denote privilege. Uh, and so while we're talking in the context of race, I think we also have to think about privilege. And Denver might be a little different, but um, I actually have recently been around folks on the East Coast, and they won't say necessarily what town they're from, because that could mm. be the other side of the track. You know what I mean? Um, and so I've kind of started to pick up on that. And then you also have, for instance, foster, um, foster care youth or youth who, people who are in the foster care system growing up. And it's a really hard question. Um, and for me as a military brat, it's like, well, here you go. Um, it's not a privilege <laughs> thing because it's with me the same way. Um, but I think sometimes th that question can, depending on how it comes or wh who it comes from, can denote a little bit of privilege and might put some folks off as well. Great point. Yeah, that is a good point. You know, I think about um, the the desire to connect with someone, to just figure out a way to build a bridge between you and another person. Mm. And and I feel like what's missing is uh, there is two there are two sides to this sort of bias bias coin, right? On the the underside of the coin is like outright racism, like I don't like X people. But on the flip side of that coin is, hey, I'm really in love with your culture, but they still don't actually see you as a person. They see you as a conduit to the aspects of the culture that they like. Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, before the world turned poisonous, I used to uh, go out and dance quite a bit. And at least once a month, uh, I would find some random white dude when they play a top 40 rap song who wants to rap all the lyrics to that, uh, to that song in my face. I don't know that song. I don't even listen to the radio, right? And in my heart, I know that that is that person's attempt to connect. They're like, I love rap music. Most rappers are black. He's black. I want to connect with him. But they don't know anything about me. And so they're choosing to connect on something that's very external. Uh, yeah, I Alan, that's if, if, we, if we were at the club and somebody did that, I would, I would. <laughs> That would be, <laughs> I'd have fun with that. I'd have, I'd, I'd have fun with that. <laughs> yeah. It, it's something. Oh, it really is. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, that's always 100% white dudes, right? But I don't feel like it comes from an evil place. I feel like it comes from a place of like uh, not being able to see beyond this one adjective. He's black. That's it. That's all the adjectives. And I think uh, the challenge for people who are who are watching this and and you know seeking and asking these questions uh, in the chat, I think the challenge is how do I begin to engage with a person's humanity beyond that one adjective, you know? And part of the question of where you're from is you're trying to figure out what the adjective is, you know. Uh, all right, so they have some people have some questions in here about uh, how do you feel? Do you get the you're so articulate kind of thing? Uh, Leslie, you're talking about sort of coded language when people try to approach you based on their expectations. So certainly articulate can, can be a, a, a coded word. Have any of you encountered that? You know, for me, you know, I um, started my career in the legal profession um, where there's all this stock and weight in terms of whether you are eloquent or articulate. And it's kind of like part of your job, normal job description is you can, you know, communicate. Um, I'd say like, I don't, I personally am not as, uh, I don't get really triggered by articulate or eloquent, but the, okay. the, the comparison of that is I've had people actually flat out say, um, and they mean it so, they're so well-meaning, but they will say, right. oh, your, Annie, your English is so good. <laughs> And man, I really struggle with that one. Like I, I, and I, you know, later, like the next day I'll be like, oh, I should have said like, so is yours. Your English is great too. But of course I don't because in the moment I'm just kind of taken aback by, well, my English should be pretty good, right? Like right. I'm from here, I'm born here, I was educated here, I'm a lawyer. Um, so, and, and again, it's like what you, what you said before, Alex, People aren't evil, they don't mean to be offensive, but it comes from the assumption is because right. of my race, because of the color of my skin, 
the assumption is, oh, English must be my second language. So, wow, you must have studied so hard to speak English. <laughs> yeah, articulate is such a code word for Black folks, though. So it's like, um, and it's so weighted. And we, we've called it out before, and people still like to use it. I mean, it's rare that, um, actually, OK, so I used to work for Governor Ritter. Um, I was okay. a senior policy advisor. And no one ever described him as articulate. No one ever described him as a good speaker, right? It's expected of him, it, you know? Um, but they do it of Hancock all the time. Of, they do it with me. Oh, you're so articulate, which is almost like you're, uh, you're one of those good Black people, you know? Right. It, it's like this, like, it's almost like comes with a pat on the head. Like, good on you, you know? Um, you're mm -hmm. like us. Um, or, you, or, you know, you, you, you speak so well, like you don't speak like them, which with them is still us. It's still me. You know what I mean? So it's like, what are you, what are you trying to say? And so articulate, which is not a word that, that was intended to have malice, right? It's not akin to the N word, but when you use it with, uh, in the context of a black person and you don't use it other times, typically it is problematic, you know, um, and has become a very code and very triggering for a lot of Black folks in particular. I mean, Obama was described as articulate so many times. And yes, he is a good speaker. You can say that, you know? But this like surprise that a Black man can speak with any type of clarity um, is offensive. I, I, I almost, oh, go ahead, James. Yeah, well, I, I almost, it is a Black thing, Leslie. There's no question about it. I mean, when, when, when that phrase is used, I mean, that it's, it's used in, in targeting the African American community, no question about it. I, I, I think it, it's almost equivalent to the where are you from question. Like for for uh, for for Latinos, that's the that's the million dollar question. And Annie, it sounds like like you've had that experience too. I mean, but that's the that's what I get all the time. I mean, and and it's not so much the language thing, it's the it's the where are you from? Cause huh. it's not from here assumption kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that brings us back to the idea of examining where do these questions come from? What are, what are the sort of secret biases that are pushing these questions? Uh, we have a question here um, in the, in the Q&A. Uh, I'm just going to read it to you guys. It says, I'm 68 liberal and have never thought of myself as at all racist. But I'm beginning to see my invisible racism and it's disturbing. How do I break old patterns that have been hidden from my own view? So I'd like to hear what, what all of you have to say about that. Yeah, it's a big question. It is. Wow. I mean, first, um, I think it's amazing that you're asking the question uh, and that you started to do the real tough work of identifying maybe how you can be better and what your hidden, you know, hidden racism or privileges or whatever that looks like um, for you are. And at, you know, 68 liberal, you know, I think there's a lot of 68 liberal and I don't know if you're, you're white or not, but uh, it says Karen's <laughs> um, white um, people, uh, you know, it's hard to start talking about privilege and about race and about racism. And uh, to, to hear that you are actually asking the question and you've acknowledged some things in your own self, that's huge. That's how you break the pattern. So I would give you a huge pat on the back actually and say thank you please keep talking about it especially in circles of people who look like you um or your family because maybe you've come a lot further than them and then now you can really start to do the work of addressing your privilege and um there's a lot of things you can do there's a lot of i mean articles and books and things that you can read but continuing to talk about it continuing to address it continuing to be extremely uncomfortable and letting you and sitting with that i think that's um, that's how you grow, and I think we're going to all be better off for it. I hope more people are in the same situation as you, and I thank you for, for acknowledging that. Yeah, I'd love to echo that, and it reminds me of one of my uh, favorite quotes I heard recently, and as from a former colleague of mine up in, in Canada. She, she would say, you know, we're, we're not necessarily responsible for our programming as children, how, you know, how we were programmed as children, but we are each individually responsible for our own upgrades, for installing the upgrades. And I just love that because I think the awareness of so much of this is, you know, 
it, it's it's so beneath it, you know it's it's very implicit um and calling it out in the first place and then having making the effort to tackle it however awkwardly it's awkward for all it's awkward for for me too you know and i think uh i think but it's also very refreshing to be able to have conversations just like the one we're having right now where we can just ask open questions and share different perspectives through different lens i think that itself is part of the upgrading self upgrading process I mean that, that that seems it seems to be a very self-selecting group. I, I, I'm sure the the uh, the people who are are listening to this conversation are want a good, healthy exchange of information and want to know what people of color are thinking and 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 how to make adjustments in their own thinking, et cetera. That's outstanding, and and, and that's why I think it's important to emphasize what Leslie said about talking to people who look like you who are who are not on the call and who haven't taken the time to kind of tune in and and listen a little bit. Um, it, it's the bridges to, to those communities, I think, that, that makes a really big difference. And, and when you identify uh, maybe your own point of privilege and, and um, are able to explain that to, to someone else and educate someone else in, in the community, I mean, I, I think that's how inroads are made. So I, I, I also yeah. congratulate you for, for uh, the recognition. That's, that's definitely the place to start. Yeah, and I just want to add one thing because um, I, I know you, you, you're in this space and a lot of folks are listening in this space wanting to know what they can do to be better. And um, there's a lot of very serious things that you can do, but I want to say something a little bit more fun. So um, the silver lining in the <laughs> pandemic is all of these random Zooms and um, things that might have been too uncomfortable for folks, like maybe going into a black church service, um, dancing with Cleo Parker Robinson dance. Um, you know, you can actually do that via Zoom now and you can keep your screen off if you don't want to be identified um, or you're not comfortable just yet, but you can actually be a bit of a voyeur and, um, and, and learn some things there. You can also participate in a ton of book clubs or race discussions or whatnot that are going on via Zoom. And it's just a little bit of a lower barrier, right? To start to have these conversations or just to experience things that you might not have typically experienced um, or wouldn't, you would be too nervous to do on your own. Um, and now you can do it via Zoom. And I gotta tell you, uh, it brings down the barriers. Hmm. Well, uh, so, you know, I, I hear the theme of, well, first of all, yes, great that people are asking these questions. Uh, for me, I think trying to distill it down is, the, I think the beginning of that search is challenging yourself to move beyond the, the one adjective, right? Like, uh, are you thinking of this person as your black friend or your Asian friend or whatever? Is that the defining characteristic? And if, if that is the one thing that's making you want to interact with them, then of course your interaction is going to be a bit flawed um, because you're not really interacting with the person you're interacting with a physical characteristic and certainly there are cultural implications to that somebody uh responded about the the white dude rapping the songs in my face at the club and uh saying that white people need to be called out for that um i don't disagree but i'm also seeing this sort of move of uh the people who uh, participate in oppression taking responsibility for shifting that right so uh when it comes to addressing rape culture, men taking more responsibility for addressing that because we're more likely to to be uh, in, in you know caught up in it, I suppose. So when it comes to these kind of things, I'm just dancing. I don't want to stop. I you know I just be like, hey, move away from me, man. You know, but I, I do like the idea of um, white people confronting each other about these issues, and I, I think it brings up a, a just sort of an interesting dynamic. Um, Okay, so we have some other questions. Uh, some of the, the bigger questions again, I guess. Uh, for Denver specifically, a lot of natives have complained about the loss of uh, cultural touchstones here. Uh, this might be especially relevant to our, our Park Hill representatives here. But this challenge of gentrification and what Denver loses in the process, um, how the neighborhood around five points has shifted. This is obviously a big and complex issue, but, um, but what, what are you guys' thoughts on this issue? 
Um, this is a really, th this is really tough. I mean, the, the Denver that I grew up in um, and appreciated because of the diversity. Um, I grew up in and went to school in one of the most naturally diverse environments. And I thought everyone had an experience like that. You know, by the time I got to college, I kind of took it for granted um, that everyone was exposed to a lot of people who did not look like them, did not talk like them, had different socioeconomics, um, uh, uh, different, different sexual orientation. Um, I took all that for granted. Um, um, kind of an old Denver tradition of having different neighborhoods that, that had different flavors. And, and I got to tell you that the loss of some of those neighborhoods is really tough. It's, it's, it is, um, it's really hard to see. And, and, and I am, I'm sorry that my kids will not have the same experience that I had uh, going through some of those neighborhoods and, and um, in, enjoying them like, like I did as a kid. Um, Five Points is one of them, but the North Side is another one. Um, and we've, we've seen massive migration from, from those neighborhoods and um, people who, who many of whom are, are, are forced out. Um, you know, we, we like to say that there was a strong and robust rebound from 2008. And I think that's true in general. But I think there's entire classes of people who never recovered. And who actually had to uh, sell um, tangible assets to be able to make it, and and a lot of that was real estate. A lot, um, you know, after two thousand eight, and and people who were, who came in from from other places where real estate had had higher values were able to to buy up quite a lot of of of, uh, of Denver neighborhoods, and it's not the same. Um, and and uh, I think that the kind of diversity that I experienced was because the neighborhoods had had different diversity in and of themselves. And we're, we're losing that. We, we are losing that. Um, and it's, it's really difficult to see people priced out of, of the neighborhood in which they, in which they grew up. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I have much to add to what um, James said. I, I completely agree. Um, and I think, you know, we can talk about gentrification for hours. Um, I feel right. like when you identify it as gentrification, it, you're too late. And so as an elected official, um, I think that we have to do a lot more to ensure that the, the cultural core and heritage and heart and soul of neighborhoods are kept, but that we can also do that alongside of economic development and growth and bringing, inter uh, bringing intergenerational wealth into a community that doesn't typically have it. And so um, that is something that I think as we go through this COVID time and this recovery, we need to pay particular mind to. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm no expert on gentrification by any means. And my experience growing up in Colorado is um, largely suburban. You know, when my, my parents first moved to Colorado from Utah, they first settled in Aurora and there are still some vibrant Asian American communities in Aurora and then other certain corridors, if you will, in the Denver metro area. Um, and then my parents did what I think a lot of parents do, which was they wanted to pick the best school district that they've, they had heard of. And so they moved right. based on school district. Um, and so that's what governed, now this is, of course, this is in the 70s and early 80s, but, um, that's really what drove them at the time. So I, you know, I, I, it wasn't until I was much later as an adult that I started um, living in central Denver and uh, moved around the neighborhoods up here in central Denver. So no, I just love, I, but I, I love hearing, you know, from James and others about, I, I like being educated about some of the history of our own uh, town. Right. Okay, well, somebody, uh, Tim, in chat mentioned that uh, gentrification ultimately is an economic question. Um, I was thinking about for 
Colorado business owners who are watching this, uh, for our three panelists, what tip would you give for them to have a more diverse employee base? Um, because obviously, in part, gentrification is based on people's access to jobs and opportunities. So like if somebody's an employer and um, they feel like there are relatively few people of color in Colorado in the job pipeline, um, what, what tips would you give for them to, to make their, their employee base more diverse? So I'll just jump in on this one because I think this is a particularly interesting topic in the time of COVID um, right. where all of a sudden, you know, the ability to work remotely or work from a distance is just a completely different reality than we've ever seen before. Um, um, but, you know, just, but to pivot on that question a little bit, I mean, one thing that I've observed um, it all, it, you know, I think when I, cause I hear, I hear that all the time. One of the first reactions to, you know, Hey, your company is not very diverse or your leadership is not very diverse or your employee base is not very diverse without fail. First or second response is, well, Colorado is not very diverse. So we have no pipeline. Mm. And where I see people jump is very well intentioned. Like, all right, we want to diversify our workforce. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the lowest income communities because of color means low income. So you equate the two. And then they say, so let's go to the schools with the lowest income students and then reach out to them. And someday they will become our entry level employees. And I hear that often enough that I, 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 I just would love to break that a little bit and say, I'm seeing I, I observe a huge gap in where people think the pipeline is because I think, you know, I'm aware of vibrant middle class and professional communities of color in Denver, in the suburbs of Denver, in the greater metro area. Um, and I don't know that I see robust enough attention applied to, you know, not just where is your line level of employee going to come from, 10 years from now or 15 years from now, but you know, where is your pipeline for your accounting department or a lateral lawyer or finance team? I mean, why isn't there more outreach um, instead of, I think there's almost um, uh, an inclination to a, a, a little bit of, of a, like a, a white savior attitude of, well, if we want of color, we've got to go to, um, the most difficult communities to break through to. And I, mm. I don't know why I feel like I'm seeing people pass the lower hanging fruit to the highest branches. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone else observes that, but I, I, I've, I've seen that pattern to some extent. I'd be curious to see if anyone sees that pattern as well. Well, I think when we're talking about economic development in particular, you've got developers, you've got architects, you've got realtors, and those those um, industries are really insular and really white. So what I would say is change your hiring practices today. Today. Um, you need to look at um, valuing different backgrounds and experiences. Pick someone who is not like you, who you don't see as the younger version of yourself that you could mold into you later, <laughs> but someone who may be completely different from you and has a different perspective. And maybe um, you both thought wouldn't have qualified for the job or shouldn't apply and be like, this is who is right for this job. This is who, this is the voice I need in this room because it's so different. Um, and, and, and it's gonna challenge us all to think differently, you know? Um, I think that's so important. I was actually um, talking with some folks uh, in the museum world and they're like, well, you know, everyone's having this conversation. How can they re just realize that everyone they work with is white, right? Like, it's like everyone is waking up and being like, oh, I didn't know that everyone around me is white. Um, how can we make the museums more diverse? And it's like, well, if you're expecting to hire your curator who has been in this pipeline forever, who has worked at this type of museum and this level and blah, 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 that pool does not have diversity, you're looking for the wrong qualifications, you know? Look for something a little bit outside of the box. Um, and then actually provide the mentorship and the uh, professional development that that person needs, you know? Um, I think that's really important as well. So 
we can do things that diversify industries right now. We don't have to wait until those kids become adults, you know? Um, I do think it's important for kids to be able to dream to be at that top branch, you know, and to see them in, in that. But a little black kid's not going to see necessar necessarily see that in a white man who comes and speaks to their class. It just doesn't really work like that, you know? I wish it did, but it really doesn't. You know, uh, my brother's a doctor. He didn't become a doctor because he saw a white guy come to his class who had on um, a white coat and a stethoscope, you know? Um, it was because he saw my dad as a respiratory therapist and then thought, wow, I'm exposed to this and I could be the doctor, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so it is about just thinking differently, hiring differently, and then um, viewing people in a way that, I think gives them a little bit more credit than as people of color we get, especially as black, brown and indigenous folks. I think a lot of times people think that our education is not enough or we're not good enough. Um, and quite frankly, we think the same of ourselves. So data even shows that um, white men do not have to, act, when they see a job application, they actually don't have to feel like they have to tick off every single qualification in order to apply for that job. Women and people of color, Think that they have to tick off every one of those qualifications and then more to even just apply. So it's a complex situation. It's a complex thing, but you just got to start where you start and you got to start like pulling the bricks out and saying, all right, we're going to do things differently and it's going to start today and we're going to value you at the table and we're actually going to retain our employees too. You know, it's, it's really interesting and, and Annie and I talked about this a little bit earlier. It, diversity in an organization a lot of times is a reflection of the diversity in your own personal circles. Um, you know, I I, I I was saying earlier that I get asked to serve on boards of directors all the time. I mean, li literally weekly, um, uh, public, private, nonprofit, whatever, um, which is great. But the but the follow up is, and if you can't do it, can you put me in touch with someone who you think can? Which to me is all right you've got to create a little more authentic relationships to be able to diversify your organizations. You, you've got to be able to reach out and network and actually have some friendships that, that, uh, that are, that are natural organic friendships that, uh, that grow out of this. And, and there's a lot of opportunities to do that. And, and to think that you can diversify, um, you know, boards of directors and, and, uh, C-level employees um, it, with, without having authentic relationships, I, I think it makes it really tough. I, I, I think it's much easier when you actually have good relationships in, in, in different communities and diverse communities to be able to, um, to bring, to bring those, um, some of those relationships into, into your corporations. Um, I totally agree. I, I totally agree and in part because I think, you know, some of the, the folks who are in charge of trying to diversify an organization, so whether it's, you know, just a head of a specific department, et cetera, is if I think it can't, it could partially explain some of this gap where if those, you know, managers, directors, leaders do not know anyone of color, do not have peers of color, um, it becomes this forgotten connection and they're like, we gotta go for the young kids. <laughs> and, and groom them to become these leaders someday. That's because it's not visible, I think, in their day-to-day -day lives of, yeah, you, there are, you know, in every field, whether it's, again, IT, legal, um, you know, accounting, all, a, a lot of different fields, um, medicine, where if there was more outreach and visibility for the people who are actually there, then those networks could grow. But I, you know, at the, in the same breath, I will say, you know, some of that sounds like the tip is make more friends with people of color. And I think that probably comes across as sounding a lot easier said than done. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I know that that's, that's hard to maybe tell someone who maybe 99% of their circle is white. Mm. And I've only recently noticed that it's all white. Um, and that's a pretty hard tip without some, you know, like the, the, the real part is like, what are they going to do? Start trolling you on LinkedIn? 
Well, I'll say uh, I think something that was interesting in what you said, James, was generally the idea of networking is put forward for uh, people who are applying uh, for jobs or who are trying to work their way into something. But maybe this idea of people who are running companies figuring out their own networking, um, trying to build uh, relationships with like the Black Chamber of Commerce or uh, go to diversity conferences within their business. And uh, I guess that would be via Zoom these days, but you know what I mean? Like actually taking an effort to network with people who don't live in your neighborhood or your zip code or who won't net naturally fall inside your, your uh, circle, maybe be begin the beginning of sort of finding a different type of diversity to the people that you have relationships with. Uh, so listen, we, I think we're down to like the last 10 minutes or so. Uh, there was a question about colorblindness and there was a question about um, whether we should teach race to children early on. Um, I want to say kind of what I think and then, you know, uh, pass it to everyone. But I, I think that a lot of times in America, we think of equality as pretending that people have no differences rather than equally respecting those differences. So um, I don't think we get very far by uh, pretending that we, we don't come from different cultures. It's more about the way that we approach it. Uh, so I do think it is good to confront race head on. That's my opinion. Feel free to disagree with me. What do you guys think? Yeah, and I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to jump off. So I will make this my closing comment. Um, uh, you know, I want you to see me as a black woman. You know, um, I don't want you to say, I don't see you that way, or I never knew. Because what does that mean? You know, um, mm -hmm. I want you to always see me and value me as a black woman. And so colorblindness is not what people of color are striving for, for the most part. And I don't mean to say that right. like we're a monolith, but it's like, you know, we want to be valued for who we are. And that includes our rich and vibrant and diverse cultures and backgrounds. And so um, I want, I want you to see that and acknowledge that. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I think that we can't erase race. We can't erase racism and colorblindness seems to presume that you're good. You know, you've got this covered. You're good. You don't see color. It's just not real. And if you can't see it or acknowledge it, um, then you might be contributing to it just as the kind of the first question that came from the audience, right? Like, um, and now realizing it, you can actually do something to make it better. So that's what I want. I want a world that acknowledges and celebrates differences, celebrates diversity and sees me as a black woman. So thank you so much to the Colorado Sun for organizing this, and hosting this. Um, thank you, Alan, for being such an amazing facilitator and to James and Annie, you're amazing. Um, it's good to chat. I can't wait to chat more. Feel free to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Bye. Thank you, Representative Thank you Heron. So and as you jump off, I would like the, we had 200 people sign up for this in the virtual stratosphere. So I would like them all to thank you as well um, in their personal spaces. Thank you for joining us tonight. And I'll just uh, piggyback on uh, what Leslie was saying. I agree, like I, I love being Asian and I want to be seen as Asian. It's part, very much a part of who I am. And um, the whole uh, premise of inclusivity is that we get to be unique and special individuals and welcomed for that difference. And I think one of my favorite parts about, you know, just the past few months and this aware, growing awareness about race is, um, you know, I, I just the appreciation that, you know, that white is a race and not the absence of race. So when I hear colorblindness, I agree, I have to echo, it's, it's just not real. It's not realistic and it's not reality. Um, when I think of it, it's not real. And I think white, yeah, it, it, white is a race. And I think for, you know, it sounds so simple, and yet I don't know that that's been the mindset, right? Like Asians are race, I'm proud of being Asian, and um, it's part of who I am. And if for, you know, people who are white, I think white is a race too. It's okay to be proud to be white. I don't think that it has to be a scary thought to be proud of your own heritage and 
where everyone's from. And um, I just love the ability to talk openly about it. Um, to me, that is one of the best parts of the last few months. Right on. Yeah. Jan, I, did you have anything to say? Okay. Well, you know, I, I just wanted to say, I, 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 think, I think part of ethnic background is what, what makes interesting people and, and those experiences and that upbringing that, that is different and um, in particular to, to your uh, family, those are some of the things that make you special, um, but, but they're not the only things. Uh, and again, when you ask where you're from, it doesn't need to be the first thing that you ask about. Um, there, there's a lot of other aspects that, that might be interesting, like, uh, you know, knowing about my work or, uh, running marathons or playing hockey or, or, you know, all the other things that, that make us interesting people. I mean, those are, I, I think those are aspects that are, that are just as important in a lot of ways. And, and, um, if we can appreciate uh, someone's ethnic background, I, I hope that we're appreciating who they are as a, as a, as a human being in, in all facets as well. Celebrate it. Yes. There, I think there's no better, better note to end on than that. Celebrate it. So uh, I want to thank Colorado Sun for sponsoring. I want to thank everyone, all of our panelists, uh, everyone who came and ask questions in the chat and the Q&A. Um, yeah, thank you guys. This was a wonderful conversation and I, I'm honored to be a part of it. Uh, I don't know if Carol wants to come in at the end and give any <laughs> final words. I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you, Alan, for moderating. Annie, James, uh, Eric, for doing our tech in the background. Thank you so much. This is a conversation that we intend to take to other parts of the state as well and other communities around Colorado because the issues in Denver are different from the issues that we have in other parts of the state around racism and bias and relationship as well. So thank you very much. Thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, we really value the fact that you took some time tonight to uh, spend with us for Embrace. Thank you. Good night all.